they make the voice. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome everyone. That is very cool. Good afternoon, and uh, we're been delighted been. to have Professor Farley's trademark class uh, here in the audience. So, congratulations, <laughs> students. Welcome. Uh, you get a double bonus what? session because we are going to talk hardcore trademark and Civ Pro and Fed Courts all in one. Um, and we're going to learn about the practicalities of trademark litigation, why this case might have been avoidable. Uh, but 20 years of litigation between these two parties over Get Lucky and Lucky Brand and was very tempted to put <laughs> but chose not to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so let's talk about, and we've got a lot of in-house talent here to, to help try to uh, parse what the heck is going on uh, between Lucky Brand Dungarees Inc. and Marcel Fashions Group Inc. Um, <laughs> to help us out, on my immediate left is Christine Haight Farley. She's a well known professor of law and faculty, director of the program on information justice and intellectual property that brings you this Supreme Court series, in which every time the Supreme Court hears a IP or related case, we do what we're doing now, invite counsel or other uh, people interested in the case to discuss what happened in the oral argument earlier in the day, as well as the overall merits, and maybe we'll do a little tea leave reading and try to see what we think the court might do. Um, she teaches trademark law, international and comparative trademark, international IP, design protection law, and art law, um, and has a, a wide variety of visiting and other sorts of uh, activities, was in Cuba talking about trademark uh, in December, um, and so welcome Christine. Uh, to her immediate left is Julie Cromer Young, who is currently a visiting professor of practice here at American University College of Law. She's teaching civil procedure, appropriately enough, uh, and advanced legal analysis. Uh, her scholarship focuses on civil procedure issues and intellectual property, as seen by her recent piece, Litigating Against Artificially Intelligent Infringer. Uh, she also has one of my favorite pieces about what happens, who, what IP rights do you have when you create the IP in outer space? She's thinking <laughs> well in advance. Uh, to her left, Professor Elizabeth Earl Besky. Um, she's taught, taught at WCL since 2010 and currently teaches civil procedure, federal courts, and legal rhetoric. Um, and she's a graduate of Princeton and Columbia, uh, where she was the editor in chief of the Law Review. Um, and she is also uh, a huge supporter of our students in a variety of ways, including chairing our, our clerkship committee and doing a lot of different uh, service for the students. So uh, Lizzie, thank you for being here and, and thank you for joining us. And last but certainly not least, a proud alumna of the Washington College of Law, Susan Kaiser, who's at the law firm of K&L Gates. She's nationally recognized IP litigator and counselor, having been named an all-star by the Managing Intellectual Property and an IP trailblazer by the National Law Journal. What a title. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she's consistently recognized by the Legal 500 and the uh, US World Trademark Review as a leading trademark practitioner. So uh, Susan's going to help keep it real for us uh, as we're going to uh, start talking a little bit about trademark, how it is these two parties got into litigation, why they couldn't work it out. Then we're going to go deep into the Fed courts and Civ Pro issues that caused the Supreme Court to want to resolve this. And then we're going to come back to the practicalities of so what? What's a trademark practitioner supposed to do? With that, so let's start with the trademark in this case involving Get Lucky and Lucky Brand as as the sort of core uh, brands in the sequence of litigation, and I'm going to ask Professor Farley to help teach us about that. So I. Ah. Okay. Everybody needs to turn their mics on since we're okay. broadcasting. Okay. When when we speak. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna show you, did this come up? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna show you um, my late afternoon research. Um, <laughs> this is my Google image uh, search for get lucky in quotations brand. Um, are you familiar with lucky brand? Raise your hand. Okay, um, let, the, let the webcasters know that almost everybody said yes to that. <laughs> are you familiar with the brand get lucky? Neither was I. So that's why I did this search, Get Lucky Brand. And so the reason I decided to screenshot my results is what do you see? What comes up when I search Get Lucky 
in quotations, brand. Lucky brand. <laughs> lucky brand. Most of it is lucky brand. Um, this is why there's a fight. So um, Get Lucky is the senior trademark user. Right? This company in the 1980s secured a trademark for Get Lucky. The lucky brand that you know is the junior user. And Lucky Brand, um, it, the, uh, sorry, uh, the Marcel Fashion Group who owns the trademark Get Lucky is also in the apparel business. And um, for those of you in my trademark class, as we were talking about in the last class, frequently you have trademark owners who are not manufacturers, but are licensors, right? They are licensing other companies to make things with the Get Lucky brand. So I um, have selected a couple of these images that, that came up. Um, are you familiar with Poshmark? Mm -hmm. um, so they, they sell, um, you know, it's a platform where people can sell their own used products. And here somebody is selling Lucky brand <coughs> jeans, but look how they're advertising it. Get Lucky! Exclamation point. Um, so just to show you how common it would be to connect that phrase with any promotion of uh, the, get, the Lucky brand. Um, and then this one is actually a Get Lucky branded uh, garment. Um, you can see the tag, if you look really closely, you can see the tag inside says Get Lucky. So this is not a Lucky brand garment. And, um, but what does it say? It says Get Lucky black long sleeve t uh, shirt. And then under, word, uh, under that it says Lucky brand. So that is incorrect. Um, but again, just kind of maybe typical of how the general public um, would be able to sort out these two, these two brands. Um, and here's another one. Um, this is, you can see because of the other picture there, this is a Get Lucky branded shirt, right? That is in the inside, Get Lucky. Um, but then the, the phrase that is, um, this is an eBay uh, listing, the phrase that is uh, selling the shirt is vintage Get Lucky brand button down shirt. So we have Lucky and brand um, together. Um, so these are just, and I think that is my last example. These are just, um, this is what popped up, right? So you can imagine um, how difficult it is for these two companies to coexist with these brands in the same market space. And if you can't imagine, then we're going to tell you about a litigation history between these two companies where for the past 19 years, they've been in court for 14 years. They've been in court for 14 of the last 19 years. And when you see the kinds of claims that are going on in these cases, you see somebody brought a suit and somebody counterclaimed and somebody moved to dismiss. You know, I mean, they, they hate each other. I think they hate each other. They want each other dead. Um, so, um, so that... Is that enough to, to pass it on well, for the beginning? Sure. Or do you I want guess, me to say something yeah, about that? Well, I guess there were the there were three lawsuits because we're going to have to get to the CivPro issue. So there's a 2001 lawsuit that ends in a settlement agreement, um, and that actually uh, the settlement agreement is entered into in 2003, and it it basically uh, says the the senior or the junior user Lucky Brand says. Fine, fine, we'll stop saying get lucky in our advertising uh, in exchange for us paying you some money and you releasing us. So then they go, they turn around and they license somebody, as Professor Crowley just says, to go ahead and start using get lucky. So then, uh, I, so then they file a declaratory judgment action, right? Say, because they know they're going to get sued. So this is like litigation jujitsu. You're going to sue me anyway. I'm going to get this. But I'm going to get this going, and I want a declaration that I'm not doing anything wrong when I've authorized somebody to use Get Lucky, uh, and they come. Back. And so they then the counterclaim is: Wait a minute, you're infringing. You you said you wouldn't do this, and you were doing exactly what you said you wouldn't do. Uh, and then we get a 2011 suit. So there are three different judgments, and one of the issues that we're going to turn to in a few minutes, but not quite is what actually got decided in those earlier litigations and what's open for fighting about based on current content, uh, conduct. Because the general civil procedure lesson is you're not supposed to sit on things that you could have raised and litigated uh, and then sort of hold them in your pocket hoping you can bring them out in a subsequent litigation. But, be, but before we do this, 
Susan, let me just ask you, is it, is it surprising to you that this issue of two parties going back and forth and maybe settling a lawsuit and then suing each other later, is it, is it surprising that that would arise in a trademark case? Well, in the context of the facts here, not at all. And I say that because of the background that uh, Professor Farley has already laid out. And that if you have two different companies using similar trademarks and they are in similar lines of business, how is there not going to be some confusion at some point unless they are staying in very, very narrow lanes and they are being very careful about carving out their space and staying there? Having represented a lot of companies, including fashion and apparel companies, for a long time, it is not that easy to control your marketing people. Um, it's, you know, lawyers might agree to a settlement agreement, but then making sure every single day your marketing people for the next 20 years after your lawyers who negotiate the settlement are long gone are complying with all of those details, it's not easy. So I think one of the one of the issues here is that something else probably should have happened in 2000 from the 2001 suit. So when Marcel first sued Lucky Brand saying we are the senior owners of Get Lucky, you cannot use Get Lucky. And they took the money and ran basically. They got a significant payment um, from that settlement agreement and basically said, "Okay, cool. We got paid." And Lucky Brands, we're going to let you go on using your, your marks because basically that's what you paid for. Um, no one really thought this one through, I'm just going to say. I, it just logically, this is why you then have the 19 additional years of fights between these companies. The marks are simply too close when these competitors, they are competitors. Um, I don't think Marcel was definitely the smaller company from the beginning. If they had a different lawyer, they might have thought about suing for reverse confusion. That was um, the obvious claim here, is that they are the senior user. They're going to have all their uses swamped. Um, but they decided to settle. And the scope of the release, even today, was at issue in the Supreme Court. And I personally thought that neither party really nailed what this what the release actually covered. They each tried with the best interpretation for their own client, but the release is not clear. So we have multiple issues here. Is that first of all, you can't you you cannot be in the same space if your marks are so similar and your competitors. Something's going to happen. I mean it's clear that what the 2000 um, the 2011 suit was not a surprise at all because literally Lucky Brands put out some marketing material that said, get lucky, and then they have their Lucky Brands marks also in connection with that marketing material. I don't think that was done willfully. I think it just slipped through. But there you are violating um, in a 2003 settlement that probably no one at the company was even thinking about at that time. Um, so that's a long response to, <laughs> if you're it, it just in the trademark space, Likelihood of confusion is the standard. It doesn't have to be the exact mark. And it's just this, these marks are just entirely too close. So not a surprise that because they didn't figure out how to resolve these claims properly in 2001, you're going to have, you're going to have problems for two decades. Understood. So that uh, Julie is both an IP lawyer and a civil pro teacher. Let me ask you to uh, remind the lawyers who uh, haven't been in law school and, and thought about collateral estoppel, race judicata, claim preclusion, issue preclusion, what? Uh, uh, what all that means? And here's a little free bar review for the students in class. Right, so, so, like, a lot of that's about raising claims again, or, you know, you've already, it's usually looking at the plaintiff's perspective and saying, you coulda, shoulda, woulda. Uh, brought this in an earlier litigation, and now now you're trying to bring it again too late. But that's not the issue here, right? Right. So let me tell you, um, when you have a preclusion, um, so for those of you who haven't had preclusion in a while, um, and for those of you who just had it last semester, um, so basically the doctrine of preclusion is the one bite at the apple doctrine, right? Um, litigants only get one chance to bring their dispute before the court. 
And that is really marked by transaction or occurrence in terms of claim preclusion and true res judicata. And res judicata, the thing has already been decided, right? So in terms of true res judicata, the thing has already been decided. What happens is you've got the first lawsuit where the plaintiff sues the defendant and brings as many claims as that plaintiff wants, and that action has to come all the way through to final judgment or something akin to final judgment. So there has to be a what's called a final ju valid judgment on the merits. And between the identical parties, about the same transaction or occurrence, or as they used in this um, a number of phrases. I know, right? Um, but as they used in this Supreme Court, uh, the Second Circuit, the common nucleus of operative fact, they use that interchangeably. So basically, it prevents the same parties from coming back and trying to get a different outcome or another outcome. It's basically the court's way of saying, OK, enough. We, we did this once. We're not doing it again. Stay home. Okay, um, so that's claim preclusion. And then another type of preclusion is issue preclusion. The parties don't have to be identical, but it takes the facts or issues that were decided by a judge or jury in the first lawsuit and basically uses those as judicial facts going forward. So you can't relitigate those particular issues going forward in a different lawsuit. That's a little bit more um, particular because it's not necessarily wiping out a whole series of litigation like claim preclusion is. But it's just talking about, OK, you can't relitigate, for example, that the, cal the contract was valid if the court found it valid in a first action. So that also requires a final valid judgment on the merits. Um, it requires that the issues be identical. The issues have to be actually uh, litigated by the parties, necessary to the judgment, and decided by a court of law. And then the party against whom preclusion is used has to have the full and fair opportunity to actually make that argument. Um, so the parties here are identical, so we don't won't get into like you know, Greek like offensive non-mutual collateral estoppel or anything like that. Um, so it extends to, um, claim preclusion extends to those claims. Um, a corollary of that is compulsory counterclaims, right? Um, so in the federal rules of civil procedure and in a lot of jurisdictions, there is also counterclaim preclusion. So um, a, a party, a defendant has to raise compulsory counterclaims in response to any claims that arise out of that same transaction or occurrence. And a lot of states also build that into their doctrine of res judicata. Um, so what isn't in the doctrine of res judicata so far are defenses, right? Any arguments. And that's what happened here. Um, do you want me to go into that? Well, maybe. Let, let me hand it off to Lizzie so we okay. can get her in the conversation, and then you guys can go back and forth a little okay. bit. So <laughs> we maybe pick up the story from there in terms of defense preclusion as an, an issue in the law, and, and maybe uh, how, how novel is it? How well settled is the law? <laughs> well, the thing to, to understand how it plays out in this case, you have to understand that, as Susan said, there are there's a trademark and it's infringed and you file a lawsuit alleging trademark infringement on day one, that lawsuit gets resolved. The in alleged infringer continues to infringe on days two through five. Um, you file another lawsuit. Um, those are perceived to be different claims, even though they relate to the same underlying trademark and even though many of the circumstances, facts and circumstances, might appear to be similar. Um, because they're different claims, ideas of claim preclusion, you know, you go to your Wright and Miller or your Moore's Federal Practice, are thought not to apply. Okay, so it's a brand new claim. 
arising not out of the same transaction or occurrence or not out of the same common nucleus of operative fact, even though, you know, superficially they're very similar, of course, um, it's, it's literally an entirely different lawsuit. Okay, so that's basically what appears to have happened in this case. We have two, well, three really, but two, for our purposes, different lawsuits alleging uh, infringements that happened at different times. And so, in fact, Marcel, for the, the, the instant lawsuit, styled it as, oh, we're just kind of trying to enforce that prior judgment. And the Second Circuit got it and said, no, no, no. This isn't an enforcement of a prior judgment. These claims did not exist in that first action. They hadn't arisen yet. There, you know, there, there was no act of infringement. And so, in fact, they're totally separate claims. So then it goes back down to the district court. District court says, all right. And Marcel, rather, um, Lucky Brand comes in and says, OK, we got this settlement um, obtained in the 2003 litigation that says we can file suit um, or rather, we can continue to use Lucky Brand and, and do whatever. Um, so the, the issue here is district court said, um, yeah, and uh, Lucky Brand prevailed. Am I right about that? Lucky Brand prevailed at the district court level? Yes, because yes, Marcel yes. was on appeal. So Marcel then goes up on appeal and says, whoa, they shouldn't have been able to bring a new defense. This is a defense that they've never actually brought um, to fruition before. And consistent U.S. Supreme Court precedent and Wright and Miller all in accord um, saying these are not similar, uh, these are not identical claims for purposes of claim preclusion. And if you're not in a claim preclusion universe, then... Can I, can I just, yeah, yeah, I just want to jump in because you said Please. something so critical there. Right, when this all got sent back to the district court from the first time it went up to the Second Circuit, that was Lucky's defense saying, look, we've, we've already been through this. We have the release in the 2003 settlement. And it had never been litigated. This is really quite a critical point here, is that no one had ever, ever litigated previously between these two parties. What does that release actually cover? And now both parties are saying it covers something a little different. Um, but it is different claims. And that's with trademark infringement. You know, wow, those facts really do matter. How you are infringing at one point in time can be entirely different at a later point in time, even if it's the same mark that's being alleged to be infringed, and even if it's a similar or the same mark that's actually the subject of the infringement. And I will say that Justice Ginsburg was, quite frankly, I think, losing patience by the time the respondent was talking. And she finally just came out and said, these are not the same claims. They are different periods of time, they are different claims. Right, and, and just so we're clear on the vocabulary, because there are two different ways for the Marcel to win here. One is to say, you had your chance and the fact that the claim was decided prevents you from raising this defense because you chose not to litigate the idea that you'd gotten your release all the way to judgment. You raised it in the other lawsuit, but you, cho you chose to drop it tough luck, or the issue of whether that release cover, basically lets you go off and use Get Lucky. It, that's a, within the Civ Pro universe, those are two separate arguments. One is the claim was decided, now I get to do it. The other is the issue was decided by you raising it and not litigating it, and we get we get to go forward. But for Professor yeah. Kay. Um, so uh, I went to the argument this morning. Um, I don't think the justices, by and large, were really happy with the answers from either party because they wanted to simplify the case and they kept they, they kept trying to put the parties in boxes. So you would agree to this, right? This this was this is the same claim. This is a different claim, and, and the parties were hedging. Um, and it and it seems to me there's something and and uh, this I want to press. Um, which is a little bit special because this case is a trademark case. And, and as Susan said, trademark cases are very factual, very contextual. And so I want to hold that off and get to it in a second. So, um, for instance, Professor Vesky, when you said um, everybody agrees this is the same claim, 
Uh, is that what you said? No, different, uh, different claims. Everybody yeah. agrees that this is different claims. I don't think everybody agrees about that. I, you know, what I heard the respondent saying is, oh no, this is an ongoing um, infringement, right? This is this is a continuation. So I, I, I think the facts are a little bit messy and, and let's hold off and, and come back to that. But um, I think there was also an interesting conversation just about the rules of preclusion and, you know, if you ever want to laugh, you have to listen to Justice Breyer. And he's like, I'm trying to remember when I was in class in 1961. And, I love um, how everybody dropped into the conversation the names of their Civ Pro professors. Yes. <laughs> and, um, and he said, and I asked my law clerks to find any case that said that, and they couldn't. And I asked my law clerks to find anybody who supported the rule that the Second Circuit came up with, and they couldn't find anything. But then there was this discussion, and uh, here I'm ignorant, so I'm just asking a question of the experts. There was a discussion about a Supreme Court case involving a landlord-tenant dispute. You know this case? I don't, and I tried okay. to find it. I just got out of Fed Court's because degree, it seemed like I couldn't maybe find it. this maybe this was a simple case factually that we could really pin down the rule. So apparently, there was a series of disputes between the landlord and the tenant because the tenant didn't pay their rent, and in a later action between the same parties involving the same problem, the tenant didn't pay their rent, although it was a different non-payment, so in that sense, a different fact. In that later case, the tenant tried to say, oh, but my lease is invalid for whatever reason. So that was a new defense. So that there's an analogy there, which I think might have a simpler fact pattern that we could all agree on what the rule had been up into the Second Circuit's If opinion. they had cited it in their brief, because on reply, the petitioner said, Breyer pressed petitioner on this rent case, and petitioner said something like, um, they didn't cite it in their brief. So I, I, that's why I couldn't find yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and Supreme, know, was and Supreme Davis Court clerks. No, it wasn't Davis. That wasn't Davis? And what was Davis? Was Davis the negotiable instruments case? Right, that was a bond yeah. case, right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, because I remember a different rent case that also was in preclusion. Um, and what had happened was, I don't know if you remember this case, that it was um, they didn't pay June, got sued for June, and then brought an action to get for July and August, but it was determined later that an acceleration clause like prevented them from suing. So it was kind of quasi-preclusion, not really. So I'm not sure if that was exactly the one. But I wanted to raise something in but, could, could, Yeah, go ahead. Would you two just answer my question? In that case, in this question in which a tenant doesn't pay rent, gets sued, loses, then in future doesn't pay rent, gets sued, and says, well, wait a minute, I've got a defense, the lease is invalid, what, what result? Issue preclusion. Um, I would say if in the first claim, in the first lawsuit, the tenant does not attack the validity of the Correct. underlying lease, um, I, don't, I wouldn't say that there was issue preclusion there. I would say my understanding, now I frantically in an hour and a half tried to find that rent case and was not successful. And Lewis, maybe, do you know it? Okay, my, my understanding. Oh, Lewis, I should have called yeah. him. I know. Um, my understanding, though, Per what I know is, though it's appealing to say, well, why didn't you challenge that underlying lease in the first action? And that's the superficial appeal that I think wooed the Second Circuit, that the way the doctrine is currently understood, you're not precluded from bringing the defense in that successive and different action. That's my understanding, Sub subject to me finding that case not cited by the parties but referenced by Justice Alito. Right. And so the reason I think it would be really interesting to know what the rules should be in that more simple case is because I think we have a much more complicated case here, right? I think that the question of were the parties always doing the same things, you know, from 2001 until um, today, the answer is clearly no. There was an evolution of the way in which um, both companies were using the word lucky. Um, you know, I think that Lucky Brands moved away to some extent from using Get Lucky um, explicitly. And at the same time, um, well, I, I mean, there were counterclaims. So, so Lucky Brands had a problem with the way uh, Marcel was licensing um, the 
the get lucky mark to others who were losing <coughs> or were lucky in a way that was too close for comfort for them. So um, I think there was some, as you say, appeal um, uh, where the Second Circuit thought, well, you know, Lucky Brands negotiated this settlement, right? They, they paid for this. Essentially, they paid for the right not to be sued for using their own marks in future. You know, so what, you know. Can I, uh, so first, uh, any other observations from the argument? And, and I do think what you're hearing here is, you know, the Supreme Court decides questions of law. And one of the things that makes this an interesting case is that the parties are basically saying, well, do, you have to decide your interpretation of the facts in this case in order to decide what the legal issue is. Is it really a claim preclusion case or is it an issue preclusion case? That depends on what you think was already decided and what wasn't. And so to me, reading, reading the transcript, there's a tension in the whole discussion as, they, as you say, they just want to know, our job is to state what the law is, and the parties keep complicating it and say, well, the law depends on what you think the facts are. Justice Breyer said, what are we supposed to decide? Um, <laughs> I'd like well, to raise well, my hand to ask one quick question. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, well, first of all, I want to um, say that in the tax area, and I don't know whether any of these tax cases came up, no. um, the Supreme Court has been clear that if you don't pay your taxes one year, um, and then you don't pay your taxes for the exact same thing the next year, um, that that is not the same claim. Those are different claims each tax year. But what I'm confused by, and I didn't read the, uh, the Court of Appeals decision, is one basic premise of issue preclusion is that the issue was fully and fairly litigated in the previous case. If you could explain to all my students in the room who I told that's a rule of issue preclusion, <laughs> how is anybody saying that this is issue preclusion? They're not. Oh, they're not. They're, they're, they're claiming claim preclusion exclusively, and they're blurring the distinction between, uh, they, they're calling this kind of the same transaction or occurrence, and that, that's the sleight of hand, I think. Yeah. Would you agree? The, I mean, the respondent is saying it's issue preclusion, and then it's saying it wasn't fully litigated, therefore we win. And, and, and even in the Second Circuit opinion, they said, oh, the doctrine, of, the doctrine of claim and defense preclusion is well settled. And I thought, wow, I really don't understand where this claim and defense preclusion came from. Uh, so I went to the Friedenthal casebook, and lo and behold, there it is, claim and defense preclusion. So I spent this afternoon reading Friedenthal came, and Miller and trying to figure out, okay, well, did I miss something here? And going, and going through, and it said, oh, there are three types of, of situations where the defense is precluded. But in each of those three types of situations, it wasn't the defense that was precluded. It was talking about compulsory counterclaims, or it was talking about um, a defense that was relied upon in a first action and then switched to become a claim in the second action. So somebody was raising it as a claim. In terms of just being able to raise the defense, um, it's like... The, they said, you know, there's nothing there. I mean, it doesn't seem like this has been the long settled doctrine that the Second Circuit made it out to be. I guess I just wanted to say in a situation where, like, let's say Professor Farley's got a trademark and I start infringing it and she gets an injunction against my use of that mark and we <laughs> litigate that and um, I lose. Uh, you know, I can't come in later. It's an ongoing injunction to which I am currently subject. I can't go challenge or get relief from that injunction on the basis that her trademark is invalid. Right? So, That's the place where it comes up. And this is where the, not only are the facts complicated and messy because it just is a trademark case, and that is the characteristic of a trademark case, um, but I think the procedural history here is extremely complicated and messy. And anybody in here a first year student? Okay, so I'm gonna to recommend to everybody who teaches Civ Pro, Lewis, you included, 
you use this fact pattern for an exam question. Because there's literally like every doctrine of Sucre in this case at some point. It plays out. You've got a nice compact story with everything happening. So, um, there, so in this case, there was a permanent injunction. exam of law school. And then a trial. And, and in the same case, the trial happened a year later. The trial on the merits happened a year after, after the permanent this injunction. permanent injunction. So this permanent injunction is really narrow, and it's limited to the use of get lucky, right? And all of this continu continuing dispute is beyond what was in that permanent injunction. That's weird, right? That, that's, a, that's a weird fact that happens. So I want to jump in with one policy question that came up in the in the argument, and then I'm going to ask Susan to close out our formal discussion and talk about some of the practice points that, that trademark practitioners can take from the mess that this litigation is, and then invite students. So students, if you're if you have a question, it's great if you could ask it from the mic and maybe go ahead and make your way there so that when we get there, we can just keep the program moving. But but what so policy behind all of these preclusion doctrines is a, a mix of uh, making sure the incentives are right. That if you're going to go to court and use up the court's resources um, and try to get to a place where you have finality under the law, because one of our values in the law is to provide some level of additional security that you know what the legal answer is once you've litigated. Um, and so that's, those are a series of the reasons, you know, make all your claims once or lose them. Um, and don't relitigate what's already been decided. What, the defense said, well, that's fine. That's, those are the right incentives for the claimant. But defendants have to choose how and where to spend their litigation resources. And what you are saying is if this is the law, if the Second Circuit is right, I have to spend money making every single defense I might raise, even though it might not change the outcome, because I'm, I want to preserve this defense in some future litigation. And that can't be the right incentive. So that, that struck me as an, uh, an argument that justices might grab onto as their sort of North Star for figuring out how to answer this. But reactions? Well, that was the one time Chief Justice Roberts did ask a question. And when the respondent got up, that was he was the first one to say, you know, I have a, this is the most serious difficulty I see with your position is just what you said. You are going to force litigants to put out every possible defense, no matter what, in the fear that they might not be able to have that defense later on if needed. I, 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 he said something very much like, I cannot imagine a rule like this that makes sense. <laughs> Pretty strong. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It makes every case a law school exam. The I think this, and I just want to say, I think this case would be an overly complicated law school exam. <laughs> can, I ask, can I answer Professor Farley's question about the lease? My view of the answer to that. Like a claim preclusion. No, my answer is it's the same claim, but it's not subject to claim preclusion. Remember, there's another option, which it's the same claim, but it falls within an exception. And if you look at the restatement of judgments, it basically says. You know, there are instances where even if it's the same claim, you are not barred from bringing uh, a, it again. And one of them is where you're subject to a possible continuing wrong, where you can either wait till the end of the lease, the wait, wait till the end of the installment contract, those are the two classic situations, or do it seriatim as the payments are not made. So I think that must have been the the reference that Justice Alito was making. He, he two or three times referred to an exception in the statement that I think he thought supported the Second Circuit's um, opinion. Um, that's the most indication that I got from any justice that there was a possibility of supporting it. Um, so I think that it's really likely that, um, that the court will overturn the Second Circuit, but, but Alito's Frequent reference to that, I think, is um, is the only thing cutting against it. Any other predictions? I still think it's going to be a nine-zip reversal, even what, with what Justice Alito said. Um, but to me, that same thing that Professor Grossman brought up could be also characterized as the Second Circuit did in its first opinion, which is 
if you're choosing to file suit on that installment contract after the first installment is due, it's not the same claim. Like, you're not subject to claim preclusion with respect to claims that have yet to accrue. Like, claim preclusion doesn't apply where your claims did not exist at the time of your lawsuit. I think those are the same thing. Um, and, but I think that's how the Second Circuit saw it. And then, Susan, what are, you know, we're in a law school. What do trademark lawyers take from this? And, and, and there were a variety of points where counsel for both parties might have made different decisions and might have uh, helped the parties resolve this, although maybe not, because for, as Professor Farley said, fundamentally, we're both selling apparel and we're both using Lucky. And uh, get lucky is going to come up as a natural sort of phrase in, in, associ in that association. But what is the practice points you take from this dispute? So I think it really highlights the importance of initially clearing a mark. And that is a basic requirement for anyone who's going to adopt a new mark, is you have to find something that is not being used by another entity that is either the same or similar. And you go through that analysis. And if you do find that there are potentially conflicting marks, you come up with a plan. Um, is this something where you could actually coexist? Do you buy them out? Um, there has to be some kind of plan. That's why this 2001 lawsuit is so interesting to me because I find it hard to believe that Lucky Brands did not do any clearance and that they were unaware of Marcel. Marcel for sure would have sent them a cease and desist letter. And it, it's odd to me that they didn't figure out a way to, like I said, either have different, much more defined lanes that they were in or Lucky Brands should have just bought them out. Maybe they thought the price tag was too high, but clearly with the amount they spent in litigation, they could have well afforded to buy out um, and, and just take over that mark. I mean, it, it was very similar. Um, there's also strategic enforcement considerations. Um, Marcel sued in 2001. In 2005, it was Lucky suing um, over the way Marcel's licensees were using the Get Lucky mark. I'm sure today they still regret that lawsuit because that's what ended up, they got then counterclaimed by Marcel for breach of the settlement agreement, separate infringement that Marcel claimed was continuing infringement from the first lawsuit, and now they are embroiled. Um, and that did not go well for them. It was really, it was quite a mess because the, the jury went in Marcel's favor. And then in 2011, Marcel's feeling emboldened <laughs> They have been grabbing money from Lucky Brands for years now. They still have their Get Lucky trademark, which is a huge right that they can still wave in front of Lucky Brands and other people. And, um, you know, they're back in court and then, you know, still a mess today. Um, I think careful drafting of releases and is really, really important. I have to say that in every settlement agreement, um, I think that there is a tendency to say, oh, well, the release is kind of standard language. It is not in any agreement, but I would say in particular with trademark infringement claims, if you're anticipating that these parties are going to continue using the marks, you need to be really, really clear what is being released, as of what date, and what then can affirmatively be used in the future. So reading through this, um, I thought that at, at all stages of this litigation. I think both of these parties could have used additional counsel on just reaching more practical results because um, even with today's argument, I, I felt like the attorneys representing these parties were still having trouble articulating what that 2003 release actually gave them. So can I um, repeat a really great joke I made on Twitter for the benefit of anybody who's not following me? Um, so 14 years of litigation between two parties, one of whom has the brand Lucky, or the trademark Lucky, and one of whom has the trademark Get Lucky. The only people who are lucky are the trademark lawyers. Um, and and it's an, I think it's just a, an interesting case that encapsulates, uh, encapsulates so much because um, while these race judicata doctrines are about efficiency, you know, get it all out, get it done, we're done, we're not going back, and you really feel this in some of the opinions below, um, at the same time, the parties want to get out of litigation. And I think, you know, the, the stuff that you can now look at with the benefit of hindsight and say, oh, they shouldn't have done that, they should have done that, 
a lot of it was like, we need to get out of this. We need to back out of this litigation. Let's reach a settlement agreement. Let's agree to language, you know, find after the jury verdict and, and all of that. Just make it stop. Make the hemorrhaging of funds stop. And that's what led to the ongoing dispute, I think. Great. So uh, I see no student questions, and I see we're losing some students to six o'clock classes. But before I let you go, it's great to have Susan back at the law school, and uh, we're proud of all of your accomplishments. And I wonder if you wouldn't mind if I, if you could, we have some future trademark lawyers in the house, and maybe if you have any little bits of advice that you're willing to share publicly, and then we have a reception and we can network further, but just in general, how did you find your path to trademark law, and, and what would you advise a young attorney uh, wanting to follow that path? Okay, so really fast. I fell into it. Um, I had a couple franchise cases and realized that at the end of the day, everybody's just fighting over that really important trademark. So I'm like, I should just focus on this. And I remember the day I decided to focus on trademarks that someone said, oh, you're never going to keep yourself busy. I said, really? <laughs> I have never been busier, actually. And I think one of the lessons is um, finding something you love and then um, really developing a specialty because then you um, make yourself very valuable to your clients. Um, it's especially in today's world, it's very, very competitive. So having, having that specialty can be really helpful. Uh, getting practical experience. And I would say to everyone, honestly, don't hesitate to reach out to people. I get emails and calls a lot from students, and I am more than happy to talk to them. And I know a lot of my colleagues are as well. So I think it's important to start thinking about what do you want to do, what is going to make you happy, and don't hesitate to reach out to people that you think are in that field of where you'd like to be. That's wonderful. And, and if you haven't had enough trademark at the Supreme Court, they seem to really have the trademark bug because we're going to do this again tomorrow with a different trademark issue about willfulness and enhanced damages. So please join us again. Also tomorrow. apparel and fashion, too. <laughs> so please join us at 5 tomorrow, and please thank our panelists for their job. you know, I need to well, yeah, I need to, I need to, to figure out how can I, you know, the, 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 oh, ethics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So that's the backup if you log into that URL. But how can I do it? It's, yes. It depends. Sometimes it gets a little funny. You are the back and all the cameras there while you're in the yeah, house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to pop up. Ah, because I tried and didn't work. Yeah, yeah work. so I had it for civil procedure oh, and it never worked. And mine works in this, which is good. No idea why. Uh, and then <laughs> did you do online? Yeah, so the URL. So, because the, the professor told me, okay, go online, but the point is that doesn't accept me online. You know, this is the... the yeah. Is, yeah. No, you know, um, maybe it's the, even the second time right, knows right, right. is this hurt even more. And the first time you didn't find self-defense, and therefore... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I... Uh, Deal. <laughs> Attend. This is the what? Ah, until now. I have seen <laughs> the, you know, the characters, and me, you know, you have to go to the, 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 the bar review. Yeah. And yeah. then yeah. once you log in, then you can put that. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. No problem. I'm glad I'm with you. Thank you. But you would utterly.
I have a meeting. Oh, so no, so the no, so the bottom line is so yeah, the second yeah, service of the yeah. either yeah. from a clean yeah, yeah. yeah. or an issue yeah. preclusion yeah. perspective. Yeah. From an issue yeah. preclusion yeah. perspective, yeah. it would undermine yeah. the essence of what issue yeah. preclusion yeah. is. Is a fully fairly yeah. litigated yeah. And, yeah. Had your day. and specifically decided. Yeah. Remember, you had your day and it was remember, necessary. Like, yeah. Yeah. If there's a verdict and, it, and it's in, if, if there's a verdict and it's ambiguous whether or not it was decided a certain way or whether it was essential to the judgment, that eliminates the yeah. question. I thought that was a decent answer, though. They were like, well, because. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, I was kind of like the underlying point. Yeah. 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 Actually yeah. litigated and decided. Oh, okay. that's yeah. a yeah. sports law. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and essential to the judgment. Yeah. 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 Yeah.